planet Earth the most precious gift we have. But what are we humans doing to this truly magical place? The place we call our home is in danger. I am here to speak for the countless animals dying across this planet because they have nowhere left to go. Every year, 36.3 billion tons of CO2 are emitted into the Earth's atmosphere. I don't have all the solutions, but I want you to realize neither do you. And this number is continuously growing. Rio Earth Summit 1992. Exactly 30 years ago, we recall the first movement concerning sustainability. It is a message of concern. Wir sind gefordert, künftig weit sorgsamer als bisher mit den natürlichen Ressourcen unserer Erde umzugehen. And if all the money spent on war was spent on finding environmental answers and, and agreements, what a place Earth would be. Over 14 days, 10,000 people talk under the motto, Think Global, Act Local. This conference must establish the foundations for effecting the transition to sustainable development. A sign of change, releasing great euphoria. A euphoria that is quickly silenced. Nothing changes. Berlin, 1995. Protests all across the world are increasing. I declare the document adopted. CO2 emissions keep growing drastically. Kyoto, 1997. A huge conference with a huge amount of people but the outcome is everything but huge. The result is a protocol that came from exhaustion. So a lot has been promised five years ago in Rio. Again, no change, meaning further aggravation. You cannot stop. Uh, you Copenhagen, cannot stop. 2009. A conference turning into a crisis. The Danish tax is an extremely dangerous document for developing countries. The survival of vulnerable people in Africa. And zwar nicht irgendwann, sondern in den nächsten 25 Stunden. Mexico, 2010. The world is shocked by the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. My mission is to change the way that we communicate, that we inspire an unstoppable grassroots movement fueled by people power. Paris, 2015. Solutions to climate change are on the table. I know that we can build a smart energy future. We can break the pollution's death grip. Finally, a great upheaval. The agreement determines to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But still, there is no change. Emissions keep growing relentlessly. Oil and gas production has doubled since 1992. We have run out of excuses, and we are running out of time. Now, it's time to act. I'm confident we can do this. All we need to do is summon the will. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hannelore Feit. I have the pleasure and the honor to host this morning's panels, starting with this extraordinary political panel. We are so proud to have two of the most important political leaders on climate here with us today. Let me briefly introduce them. On my left, on your right, Michael Regan, the administrator of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States of America, and he is here as the official representative of President Biden. Also, as we have heard, the pollution terminator. <laughs> <laughs> and on my right from Europe, Vice, Pre uh, Vice President Franz Timmermans. He is one of the leading voices on climate change, on the European Green Deal, which, as you may know, is the roadmap for Europe to become the first climate neutral continent. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Ambassador, um, <laughs> Administrator Regan and Vice President Timmermans.
Governor Schwarzenegger, I can still see you. You're still with us. Hello, Toronto. Thank of course, you. I'm still with you, even though for me it is now four o'clock in the morning, but it doesn't matter because I just fi finished filming two hours ago, then I changed quickly, cleaned up a little bit to, to give my speech. So I'm here the whole night. I was going to ask you if you were getting up real early for us, but no, you're staying up late for us. Thank you for doing That's this. Right. And I know you want to start this conversation. You have questions for the two guests, the political leaders here on the stage. Well, thank you very much. And I just want to say uh, you always do such a great job here. And it is great to, to talk to Michael Regan today, our secretary of the environment. And I just wanted to ask him uh, to explain a little bit about how he became the EPA secretary. Uh, because uh, this is always a huge and a big responsibility, a big, big job. And I know that uh, it had a lot to do with the great and extraordinary work that he did in North Carolina, because you accomplished the biggest settlement uh, with the coal companies to clean up their pollution. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And how, because that's when I started paying attention to you, and I started noting of all the great work that you've been doing. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Well, thank you for that question, Governor. And, you know, it actually started from my early childhood days. I grew up hunting and fishing with my father and grandfather, so I really enjoyed the outdoors. But uh, close to the narrative you shared earlier about pollution, I, too, suffered from respiratory distress at times when there were high pollution days. So that's where my desire to fight pollution started. And, yes, the, the governor of North Carolina appointed me as the environmental secretary uh, not only did we put forward strong climate resolutions, but we continued to fight pollution, and we decided that we would pursue the coal ash cleanup in North Carolina, the largest cleanup in United States history. Uh, from there, I caught the eye of this current administration, and President Biden uh, and I interviewed, and I knew immediately that based on his vision for this country, in terms of clean energy and fighting the climate crisis, I had to be on the team, and I'm fortunate enough to have joined that team. Very nice. Now, when you talk about the, uh, the, you know, his vision, I think part of this vision is to cut emissions in half by the year 2030. So my question really is, is, is this just another politician's talk, or is there really a blueprint to cut those emissions. Can you talk a little bit about that? There is absolutely a blueprint. The president said from day one that America is back in the game. And his blueprint really encompasses the entire government of the United States, from the Department of Defense to the EPA. All of us are finally, for the first time in history, rowing in the same direction. And EPA is at the tip of that spear. Uh, just recently, in the past year, we finalized the most aggressive greenhouse gas emission standards for light-duty vehicles, cars, and trucks. We're pursuing the same types of regulations for heavy-duty vehicles as well, not just because we're pursuing uh, eradicating the climate crisis, but we have young ladies like Ella in mind, where we have that, those PM 2.5 and NOx emissions that exacerbate asthma. We proposed a rule to phase out HFCs by 85% in less than 15 years, another highly potent greenhouse gas emission. We proposed the most aggressive methane regulations for the oil and gas sector, both new and existing sources. And we've also started to put a blueprint together for the power sector so that we can ben begin to phase down coal. So the president has a vision, but more than just a vision, he has a blueprint and EPA is taking action. Well, I'm very happy about that, that uh, America is getting the act together, and especially with your leadership. Uh, the question is just, that we, as you know, we don't really call this American, uh, you know, climate change uh, uh, or, you know, Brazilian or the Chinese or Russian or well, European or whatever. It is global climate change. We're talking about global. And so what is the United States doing really to make uh, all the countries kind of work together to make the whole world, to bring the whole world in and to work together on this issue? Well, I think it uh, embodies your vision, Governor, which is leadership. Leadership matters. And the president understood from day one that America getting back on the global stage, demonstrating true leadership, would create that competitive environment that we all enjoy and love. 
I believe and he believes that if we join arm in arm with all of the countries in the world, row in the same direction, focus on this crisis in a very serious way, and put some rules of the road in place, but also leverage the technology, the jobs, the globalization in terms of a competitive market, that those forces can be driven together and collectively all of us all across the world can solve this problem and do it in a way that it serves as a rising tide for every single person in this world. Fantastic. Now, I have also a question for Vice President Timmermans. Um, you are a great leader in Europe with the environment. I mean, you've done fantastic work, and it's, I know it's very, very challenging to bring all of those 27 uh, nations together in Europe and to think and, uh, and, and work in one direction. I mean, but the question really is, how does the, the Ukrainian war uh, have changed the European outlook on energy and on fossil fuels and pollution and all of those kind of things, uh, uh, what's going on right now with the Ukrainian war? Well, Governor, before answering your question, let me say one thing. As someone who has lived in Russia for three years, I know how immensely popular you are in Russia. And I really want to commend you for your tremendous speech directly to the Russians. That was a show of leadership that I've seldom seen, Governor. And I think you need to be commended for that because it was courageous. Not everybody likes to hear your message, but it was so important you delivered it. Thank you. Thank you. And in answering your question, one of the things we've learned, uh, you know, people say we were naive, not understanding what the Russians did. I think, frankly, we were just greedy. Greedy because we were addicted to cheap energy. Um, everybody who studies Russia and who's followed it knew what was coming at least since 2014, since they occupied the Crimea since they uh, were uh, culpable of shooting down uh, uh, an airliner um, where uh, 296 people, innocent people, were killed. So, you know, we just couldn't get rid of our addiction. Now we have to get rid of our addiction very, very, very quickly. So what this war does is just increase our sense of urgency, increase our commitment to get out of fossil fuels as soon as possible. The only way Europe can create sovereignty, energy sovereignty, because we don't have our own oil, we have very little coal left, we have very little gas left, is through renewable energy. We need to speed up our transition to renewables. We can do it. Um, the federal government in Austria is taking bold steps in that direction. Um, we have made a proposal called Repower EU that will help other governments also to do permitting much faster, not in seven years, but in one year. We need to put um, solar panels on all the rooftops in Europe. We need to increase the production of uh, wind energy. We need to double our production of uh, bio uh, uh, gases. That is what we need to do in the years to come. That is the only way we can rid ourselves of the dependence on, of Russian gas and oil, and we need to do it at lightning speed. And I have another message. This is not just for the time of the war. Putin has a plan. It's to show that autocracy trumps democracy. So we cannot allow for Putin to win this war. This war is about our values. This war is about open societies, about democratic societies. All Putin's friends in, in, in Europe and in the US are now hiding under the table, hiding their allegiance to this man. But if he is victorious in this war, they will be dancing on the table and they will be trying and imposing Putin's vision of society on us. This can never happen. We are fighting for our freedoms. We are fighting for our open society. We need to make sure that Ukraine comes out victorious of this war. Governor, Governor if I may uh, jump in here. We have an international audience, Vice President Timmermans, to understand the European viewpoint better. We want to be climate neutral by 2050. Is this realistic? We have a plan. We already have a legal obligation on all member states, 
legal obligation, not a commitment, a legal obligation to reduce their emissions with at least 55% by 2030 and to reach climate neutrality by 2050. We have a Fit for 55 clear plan in all areas where transformation is needed. It's a plan that starts today. We are fighting in the European Parliament with the Council to get these, this legislation approved as soon as possible. This is how we're going to be uh, uh, moving ahead. It's a concrete plan. It's not, you know, it's easy to make a commitment, we'll be climate neutral by 2050. Yeah. It's much more difficult to have a plan, and the plan needs to start today. Today, you know, um, uh, look at look at Governor Schwarzenegger's uh, career. Uh, for him, 20 years ago is is like one breath. 20 years from now, we're in 2050. We need to have this done. 28 years from, from now, that is a huge, huge task. But we can get there if we stick to the plan. There was France, a set. I just wanted to have a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Uh, I mean, a lot of the European countries have signed on, um, you know, and made commitments to do accomplish certain goals at a certain time. So far, only a very few countries have really come through with their commitment. How do you, as a leader there now, go about to go and make those changes and really push them so they actually are acting, not just talking about those goals? Well, you know, the, the so-called Fit for 55 proposal we propose has many elements. Energy transition, the reduction of the use of energy, um, uh, investment in renewable energy, hydrogen as a new commodity that's going to be extremely important in the future. And this plan is comprehensive. So some member states don't like one element of it, others don't like the other element of it. But at the end of the day, it's a balanced plan. And I am sure our member states will endorse it with some changes, obviously, that's how you negotiate, but they will endorse it in a year or a year and a half from now. And then we're on track to get to where we need to be, and all member states will be on track. And nobody's doing this to do a favor to somebody else. Every single country on the world now knows we're all suffering. This climate crisis is not going to go away. We can mitigate it, but it will be with us forever. And we need to sh make sure we mitigate it, because if we don't, I know one thing for sure, our children and grandchildren will be fighting wars over water and food. And it is our responsibility today to prevent that from happening. Well, Franz, thank you very much. And I really appreciate your great leadership and your passion. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can feel the passion that you have for this subject. Hey, guys, I have four kids. I have two grandkids. I have a reason to be passionate about this. I would like to bring in another person. At this point, exactly 30 years ago, 154 countries agreed to fight climate change. We asked Severn Kali Suzuki, who you just saw in the short film before, about her views today. In 1992, the media called her the girl who silenced the world for five minutes. Listen what she told us yesterday. When I look back at Rio, I think of all the good people that were there and the feeling that we had, you know, when I gave my speech, everybody got to their feet. There was such a feeling that we are sharing responsibility. We shared a moment. And when you look at the declarations that came out of Rio, there was an, some incredible work done. You know, the Convention on Biodiversity, Agenda 21, um, the United United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I mean, these are infrastructures that we still are depending on for the way that we negotiate on these these matters. So much came out of there. But at the same time, of course, 30 years on, you know, we didn't stop climate change. And we have ecological problems that are far, far worse for our children to deal with. One of the things that I feel, you know, that is really different now than then is the rise of the, the power of of companies, of corporations, and that really has shifted the power of, of governments. And yet corporations, these are not uh, democratic institutions, and they're pursuing profit for shareholders, not the well-being of human citizens. So this is a huge shift, and this is something that governments have to grapple with as their power has been um, much eclipsed by the power of corporations that now have, you know, profits that uh, that rival whole uh, economies. Unfortunately, after Rio, climate change in particular, but I would say, you know, many aspects of the environmental movement became so polarized. And so they 
politicians who, you know, m much of the world politicians uh, and leadership at Rio were saying they were environmentalists. You know, in 1992, we had people who who said, "Yes, we're greenies, we we care," and yet then the politica, you know, how how polarized the issue became, and especially the investment that fossil fuel fossil fuel companies put into climate denial. Well, it worked, and so even though you know perhaps political leaders may have had goodwill and wanted to do the right thing in 1992. Then they were constrained by the power of these companies, these uh, corporate interests, as well as the polarization of these issues. And you know, uh, climate denialism—it really worked. It slowed us down. It didn't allow us to do the actions we needed to do to avert the to avert climate change. And now here we are. Today we talk a lot about the climate emergency, and yet. We have just seen what a, the, a real response to an emergency looks like in terms of COVID. So if you would told me a couple of years ago that the world's governments would move billions of dollars every week to address an existential emergency, that the world's governments would listen to science and prioritize science and information and data to make their moves, that all of society would have completely transformed our way of living. If you told me these things, I wouldn't have believed you. And yet we have just seen this response across the world. And while we're not, while we're not completely out of COVID, we've, we've more or less made it through. This is the kind of response we are capable of. We are entirely capable of meeting the climate crisis, but we have to really treat it like a crisis. And we are not doing that, not by any stretch of the Im imagination. We saw that you all did it, all our world leaders, local leaders, individuals. Now we need to do that with climate. We know we can, and that is the level of action that we need today. Definitely a strong message from Severn Collis Suzuki. Administrator Regan, what do you say to young people today to give them hope? Because the future is theirs. The future is theirs, and I, I am so optimistic. Um, every major movement in United States history has been led by young people, and this is going to be no different. Um, I travel the world and meet with young people and they are holding us accountable. So it's, it feels really good to be held accountable. I'm also reminded of what happens in my own home. I, my son is eight years old, and I'm the EP administrator, yet he is the lead environmentalist in our home. He's the one that reminds my wife to turn the water off while she's brushing her teeth, or he's leading all of our recycling efforts. He's ensuring that we turn the lights off. Some of that, yes, we've taught him, but a lot of it is second nature to him. So to watch our young people at all ages and all levels lead and have sustainability as a second nature, it's just really inspiring. So I'm very, very optimistic. I think the same goes for you as far as young people are concerned. Sure, I am, but we need to show solidarity with them and we're not yeah. doing that enough today. Yeah. They show tremendous solidarity with our generations during the COVID crisis. They were not really at risk, but they obeyed all the rules. They did the distancing, they wore the masks. They did that to protect us. Now we need to protect them and their future. We need to do more. Young people, yes, but not everybody in this world is convinced that climate action needs to be taken. Uh, what do you tell uh, business leaders, industry leaders who are not really convinced that this is the moment to do something? Well, you know, we're not just in a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. We're also in the middle of an industrial revolution. And they better start <laughs> investing in the economy that's coming. Because otherwise, they're creating huge amounts of stranded assets for themselves. That money will be lost. That money will be lost. We are now also using a lot of public money to invest. But if we don't invest that into the future, into climate neutral technologies, into circular economy, that money will also be lost. And then our children will be crippled by debt. So, but if we invest it wisely today, we will create a high-performing economy with high-performing jobs for everyone. Nobody needs to be 
unemployed in the economy that's coming. And we cannot afford to leave anyone behind. This has to be also a fundamental age of fair redistribution of everything we have. And we need to do it now. Politics needs to do this. We cannot trust business leaders to do it. But we need to point to where their interests, long-term interests are. And more and more and more and more of them understand that if they don't change their ways, they will create stranded assets and lose billions. If they change their ways, they will create an economy that's going to be tremendously profitable for them as well. If we look at politics, there was a setback last week in the European Parliament. Uh, what's your take on that? I think it was sort of a, um, a car crash. It wasn't intended to be a setback. I think they're all talking to each other again to try and solve it as soon as possible. I'm optimistic. I think they might be able to solve it still this month. That would help us to get ahead and also convince the governments to speed up their act. So you think we can do it soon? I think, I th I think I'm confident that the European Parliament has this tremendous sense of responsibility. They're the ones who declared the climate emergency. So if they declare a climate emergency, they also have, have to take the responsibility of setting the legislation in motion. I'm confident they will do that later this month. Administrator Regan, you have placed environmental justice at the center of your work at the EPO, EPA. Can you explain to us what environmental justice is and why is it so important to you? You know, it's, it's absolutely uh, a core pillar of President Biden's administration and everything we're doing at EPA. Environmental justice is the fair and equal regulation of pollution for every single person in the United States and around the world. We know that uh, those who are low income and in the United States who are black and brown have been disproportionately impacted by pollution for generations. We also know that around the world, when we think about climate change, those who least can afford it and who have contributed the least to this problem are impacted the most. So we have a moral obligation as a society uh, globally to ensure that as we think about this new industrial revolution, this new economy, that we create a rising tide that lifts all boats. Everyone deserves clean air, clean water, and to be safe from environmental hazard and harm. And so environmental justice is leading the way for us. We believe that if we do it in a fair and equitable way, we'll have a better world. At the outset, when um, President Biden started uh, his term, he had a very, very comprehensive proposal also for climate change and, and climate protection in uh, the uh, program, in his plans. Uh, there is still a lot of uh, haggling, haggling going on between uh, the parties. Congress hasn't done much. How do you see that advancing? You know, it's interesting. I, I, the, the political rhetoric just doesn't match the actions on the ground. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute and the United States Chamber of Commerce, the business interest, actually asked us to regulate methane. <laughs> we are seeing our CEOs and our businesses really understand that the new economy is a clean energy economy. They don't want those stranded assets. They want to be globally competitive. And so really the argument isn't whether or not we need to move forward, it's how quickly we need to move forward. Some of us are still arguing over the science. We know that we're facing an existential threat. So the goal is to have a conversation and a discourse that marries that sense of urgency with the desire to be globally competitive, create jobs, and really advance technologies in ways that we haven't seen before. Do you see some bipartisan action there? I see bipartisan action all the Will time behind the scenes. Okay. Uh, when the cameras come on and people take their political corners, mm -hmm. uh, that level of discourse uh, is disingenuous and it really slows down what we could be doing as a country and as a society, society globally. And so I'm optimistic that we can continue to have these conversations and move the ball forward. When we talk about bipartisan, and I see you're still there, Governor Schwarzenegger, bipartisan action is also one of your big themes, right? That's right. I, I, I believe very strongly that we have to have everyone involved in this 
And, um, you know, it doesn't matter if the Republicans maybe feel more negative towards this whole issue, but this is all about leadership. When you're a great leader, you are able to bring people in and bring them to the table. That's what we have done in California. The reason why we have been successful in California was because I never looked at the other party as the enemy. I always looked at them as kind of like part of the system. I brought them in, brought them to the table, and we were able to pass in California the strictest environmental laws in the United States because we were inclusive. Our administration was inclusive. And, <clears throat> and I think that I want to say this also about other things. I think that uh, it is important for us not to just villainize um, you know, corporations. Uh, or not just to villainize a party or, or so. We have to kind of have a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach on this whole thing. We got to bring everyone together. We got to bring the, the public sector together with the private sector. They all have to work together to make this work. And this is how we were successful in California. The other thing is, is as soon as you start blaming one or the other, then you let everyone else off the hook. Like if you just say, you know, the corporations are at fault here, then you go basically say the general public is fine. You got them off the hook. But the fact is the general public has to be educated that they are part of the solution. They are the ones that are buying products, for instance, that are from China or from overseas, from other countries. That takes then a lot of shipping. Those ship, these container ships, they are polluting the world. I mean, the 15 of the biggest container ships uh, create more pollution than all the cars in the world. So, I mean, so we have to really think and really let people know, educate people that they are part of the solution. And that's why I was so excited about the electric cars, that we now have electric cars where no one can say anymore, well, they're too expensive. You can have a truck today that uh, Ford came out with that is $40,000. If BMW is coming out with cars now and other companies are coming out with cars that are affordable. So when you buy your next car, Think about going electric rather than buying one with a you know, combustion engine. So there's a lot of things that the general public can do, but we can only do that if we educate the people and if you let them know it's dealing, we're dealing here with pollution. Because soon too many of the environmentalists talk always about you know, climate. You know, they start out and they say, well, our biggest problem is climate. And people say, what is he talking about? Why is our climate the biggest problem? But what they really want to say is pollution is the biggest problem, and pollution creates the climate crisis. You see, so this is why we have to tell people it's pollution, and then they understand it, then they see the emergency, that pollution kills 7 million people. You have to hook it together with health and with death and with all of those kind of things, rather than talking, just talking about this holistic thing, how there's climate change and it causes fire and storms and wind uh, and all of this kind of thing. It, it, that's not enough for the people because that's about, okay, there's a problem that they have or they have, or there's a problem of tomorrow. No, pollution. But that's why I wanted to mention the story about Ella. I mean, it's about the, that is pollution killed. The climate change didn't kill Ella. Pollution killed Ella. And so we should talk about pollution. It's, a, it's just a different way of communicating to hit the target rather than the shotgun approach and being all over the place and not really bringing the public along. Thank you, Governor. There are some examples we'll discuss later on this morning. I'd just like to ask the two of you, Ukraine crisis energy crisis, people are thinking of how do I pay my running costs? How do I pay for my daily life right now? But if you look at it, if, you, if we look at it the other way around, could that also be an impulse, a push towards uh, climate action? Because we are realizing now it's, it, it, we can't go on. Oh, I think so. I think the, the biggest threat we face is that we leave people behind in all of this. Uh, Administrator Regan is right when he says, any crisis that happens affects poorer people more than richer yeah. people. Any crisis, including the climate crisis. And many people in our societies feel left behind already. And then they're looking at the climate crisis and our response to it. And they fear they're going to be left behind here as well. So we have to make sure we leave no one behind uh, in whatever we do. And if I can just quote one example where things are wrong, when things are felt as being wrong in society. This war has led to incredible boosts of profits for oil and gas companies. I mean, they're, they're making three, four times more than in a normal year because of the war. At the same time, people paying for their energy bills see their bills double and triple sometimes. That doesn't square. That, that's just, that feels like so 
unjust in the society. And if we don't fix that sort of thing, we will not be able to convince people to be part of the journey to a climate neutral society because, you know, I, will, I, will, I, can, I can answer your question, madam. We need, we need to um, dedicate some of the um, uh, efforts in the years to come to transition. Uh, like, with, like with, we are so addicted to fossil fuel. We but do you want to hear, hear my answer or not? Our audience, our audience cannot hear you. Uh, we have, we, some of our member states need nuclear energy in the transition to renewable energy. They need it in the transition to renewable energy. Other member states fundamentally disagree with that. We have to respect that point of view. I fully respect the Austrian point of view that nuclear energy can never be an element in our energy mix. Other, member states, other member states, including Austria, needed natural gas in the transition to full renewable. And we have said, as a transitional measure, natural gas can serve that purpose. Yeah, well, uh, sorry, if sorry. you're not interested in my uh, answer, please sit down. I'm giving you my answer. Uh, I'm sorry, we cannot hear your question. People are on the live stream. Nobody can hear your questions. Let me just let uh, Vice uh, uh, President Timmermans answer the question. We're talking about nuclear energy, and you were saying this is just a, a way of transitioning well, for, for, to a green... Uh, for some, for some right. member states, the transition to renewable will take a bit more time. And they cannot afford to be without electricity in that interim period. And for them, nuclear energy can be a bridge to that period. Other member states categorically refute that. And we have to, as the European Commission, we have to respect both positions. That's the only way, the only requirement we have is that member states reduce their emissions by 55% by 2030. And that will get us to climate neutrality by 2050. And if we don't use bridging technologies, we will never get there. That's the fact, you know. Wake up, smell the coffee. That's the reality. Thank you for that answer. Um, Administrator Regan, uh, you also in the United States have this very, very progressive goal, um, even f getting there even faster as, as it was originally planned by 2045, as I re if I recall. Uh, you still hope, do you still have hope to achieve that? We do. Um, we, we absolutely have, we didn't get into this situation overnight. We're not going to get out overnight. We have to transition in a way that meets the moment of the scientific needs, but also we cannot leave anyone in the dark, uh, especially our poor and our vulnerable people. So we have to transition responsibly. I believe uh, that we can do it. And the reason I do is in the United States last year, 80% of investments in new capacity were in wind, solar, and battery storage. The market is demanding it. People are demanding it. The cost of technology are coming down so quickly. So whether it's electric vehicles or looking at our stationary uh, power generation, uh, we may exceed many of our goals if we can put some policies and regulations in place to encourage long-term investments. Governor Schwarzenegger, I see you still with us. Do you have some... Uh, thoughts on what Europe and the United States can do, some advice maybe for Europe and the United States, the governments on these two continents? Well, I just have a simple advice. If they just copy what we have done in California, everyone is going to be home free. This is really the, 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 the best thing to do. But uh, just before I leave, I just want to say thank you to both of the gentlemen for being with us today, your extraordinary leaders. And first of all, I want to say Michael Regan, uh, to our secretary of the EPA, thank you for getting California the waiver again, the federal waiver, so that we can regulate our own air. You have been a real force behind that. So thank you very much for helping us in California to clean up our air and to do everything environmentally uh, the right way so that we can hit our goals. Uh, and also I want to say thank you to Franz. Uh, you know, whenever I heard the name Franz, I said to myself, this is like Saturday Night Live. You know, the Hans and Franz uh, comedy routine. 
<laughs> it was really funny. And so the Hans and Franz, yeah, we pump you up. And so you're here today, of course, pumping everyone up about the environment. So you've been terrific, very passionate. Thank you very much for being with us today. And I hope I see both of you very soon, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Schwarzenegger. Thank you, Administrator Regan. Thank you, Vice President Timmermans. There are solutions out there. You have given us some hope, and thank you very much for that.